Hey, howdy everyone. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record all of my lectures. And this is the lecture getting us into probability, part of the second main unit within my Introduction to Data Analytics and Geostatistics course. So let's get into probability. We'll talk about very quickly, just kind of fundamentally about what probability is. And then we'll switch into frequentist probability. We'll have a bunch of Venn diagrams. We'll talk about probability logic. And we will then lead ourselves, derive our way to Bayesian probability and show how we can use Bayesian probability formulations to solve unique problems. So let's get into it. What's the motivation? Why do we want to cover probability when talking about data analytics? Well, first of all, we need probability to support decision making. Data analytics and statistics are all about supporting decision making and we need probability when we're supporting decision making in the presence of uncertainty. It's essential to quantify probability. It motivates decisions. What's the probability that we'll have a successful well, be it hydrocarbons or water or whatever it might be, would help inform the decision of is it worth it to drill the well? What's the probability that a valve has a crack in it? You've done some type of scan on it, x-ray type of imaging or such, and you say it looks like it has this probability of having a defect or a crack or some damage to it. You can use that to determine whether or not you should replace the valve. What's the probability that a seismic survey will find a reservoir? How good is it? How accurate is it? What have we found historically? Well, that'll help us defend, if you think about it, the whole area of decision analysis is all about trying to find the value of that new information and to balance that with the cost of that information and we'll determine whether to acquire the seismic. What's the probability a reservoir seal will fail? Well, if you're doing carbon dioxide sequestration, CO2 sequestration, that's essential. We don't want to inject into the subsurface only to lose containment later on. We need to guarantee those volumes remain in place for extended periods of time. Most of our decisions in the subsurface, and I would say many spatial settings, require us to quantify probability because of uncertainty. And that helps us make better decisions. By communicating uncertainty, our work is used directly in the decision. And as I always tell my students, if your work contributes directly to the student, you have great line of sight to value and your work will be seen as valuable and you'll be rewarded for it. So it's a win-win for everybody. Now let's, with that motivation, let's get into probability and talk about probability together. So let's start. What is probability? How do we work our way to it? Now what we can do is we can go back and look at some of the work of the past and Komogorov gave us three axioms around this concept of probability. He said that it's going to be a metric or measure that follows these three axioms. Probability of an event is a non-negative number. There is no such thing as negative probability. It wouldn't make any sense. So the probability of an event A, and A could be any event at all, is going to be greater than or equal to zero. That's the first axiom. So far, so good, right? Not too bad. Probability of the entire sample space are all possibilities, which we will always represent as omega, which is all possible outcomes, must be equal to one. If you take account of all possible things that can occur and nothing outside of that can occur, then the probability of that happening is one. It's 100% that one of those things must happen. So probability of omega, the complete set, is unity or 100%. And then additivity of mutually exclusive events or unions. In other words, what is the probability of the union of events A subscript I, where I goes from one to the total number of different events that can occur? And what do we know? Well, if they're mutually exclusive events, then we know that we can just sum the probabilities over those possible I through whatever number of possible events. So in other words, if we have only two possible events, A1 and A2, then we can solve for the union A1 or A2, 
as simply as summation of the probability of both of them. So these are fundamental axioms that any measure of probability we come up with should follow these and then they'll be valid. So this is this seems pretty fair. Now let's think about how we can actually come up with the measure. What are the different fundamental ways that we can go ahead and calculate this representation of probability? Well, let's back up and look at four different ways that we can think about probability. The first one is we can think of probability as being a long-term frequency. Now, we'll introduce this in the next lecture as being the frequentist perspective. And really what we say is the frequentists simply run an experiment and count the outcomes. They take the ratio of the total number of times that a event occurred over the total number of experiments that were run and they say probability is that ratio. Now what's very interesting is this approach requires repeated observations of an experiment. Now if we get deep into the details of this you'll find in fact that in the purest form, frequentist probability doesn't actually exist outside of the experiment. You only have that probability when you run the experiment, only for the samples you ran the experiment on. And that's that's kind of the kind of the most purest interpretation of frequentist approach. You'll see when we talk about frequentist approaches, we're gonna relax that. We're gonna say, yeah, we ran an experiment, we had an observation, we're gonna use that probability elsewhere. We'll assume stationarity. We'll get into these terms later on, but we're going to relax that a little bit. But let's just leave it at this. Frequentist approach is based on long-term frequencies observed over an experiment. Now, there's another category that's very interesting, and that's physical tendencies, propensities of the system. And this, I actually really appreciate, appreciate as a geoscientist and engineer, because it's based on the idea of knowledge of the system. You understand the system, you know how the system should behave. Can't you use that to work out probabilities with regard to outcomes from that system? I'll give you a very simple example. If you toss a coin, the probability of the coin landing on its edge is in fact, it can happen, but it's basically a very, very small probability. I forgot, I looked it up at some point, it was like one in 10,000 or something like that, that that ever happens. So we suspect that if the coin is not weighted, that really it should have a 50-50 of landing heads or tails. We don't need to run that experiment. We don't need to use long-term frequencies to measure that because we know the coin. We know how the coin was designed. We know how it's um, the density in the coin, that it's not weighted in a specific way. We know about the dynamics of that system. And so we can expect by physical tendencies to have a 50-50 probability of heads and tails. Now, there's another approach and that is based on degrees of belief. We have a probability it's based on our certainty about a result. Now, what's interesting about this is very flexible. We can assign probability to anything. As soon as we say we're going to use belief, we can solve all kinds of problems that we may not have been able to run the experiment. But we can use some other assessment. And, and, and we'll, when we get into the Bayesian approaches, as we intru introduce it formally, we'll talk more about what a prior is. But that's the whole idea. It's based on your experience in which leads to a belief. It's very flexible. We can assign probabilities to anything. And then what we'll do is we'll update as we get new information. And we'll talk much more about that. That gets us into a more of a Bayesian approach as opposed to the frequentist approach based on experiments and counting. Now, there is a fourth category. And to be honest, I find this a little bit difficult to differentiate from the third category. And so I don't tend to use this too much going forward. But let me just, for the sake of completeness, just mention it. This idea of degrees of logical support. It's kind of, it's a generalization of classical logic. It's basically like three, the degrees of belief, but they say it's more objective because they said we won't allow feelings. And I, I'm sorry, to me, it gets very hard. I feel like we're splitting hairs at that point because of the fact that as soon as we talk about belief, 
it's really hard for me to kind of separate and say what's feelings versus belief and what's experience versus belief versus feelings. Okay, so let me, I will leave it there as far as, as far as saying that there are really three main categories from which we can calculate our probabilities. Now, what we're going to do in the next lecture is we're going to dive into this idea of the frequentist probability approach. And so we'll talk about how we can use experiments and counting. We'll do a bunch of Venn diagrams and then we'll build up from there and get to Bayesian probability. I won't treat number two or number four really in the subsequent lectures. We'll build from one to three and then we'll finish up there. Okay, so I hope this was a useful lecture to you. It was short. We will get into much more discussion right away here. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm on Twitter. I'm the Geostats guy, and I share daily content on data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. And I promise only just a few kayaking pictures and maybe a couple of pictures hiking and dogs and such. But in Star Trek. But anyway, so I hope this was useful to you. All right. Take care, everybody.